So it's a real pleasure, Glenn, to have you back on ICMDA webinars. Western culture appears to be obsessed with issues of identity. And today's session, we're going to review the rise of modern selfism, its philosophical roots and the role played by psychology and psychiatry in cementing its cultural power. We look at possible impacts in terms of mental health and well-being. And finally, we ask how the Christian faith engages with the challenges it poses. Professor Glenn Harrison is Emeritus Professor of Mental Health, University of Bristol, and a retired clinical psychiatrist. He specialized in psychiatric epidemiology and early interventions for psychosis. And he now lectures widely on issues at the interface of faith, mental health, and culture. So Glenn, over to you, real pleasure to have you back, thanks. Uh, can I just say, first of all, I, I'm conscious um, that we have a hopefully a, an international uh, audience, people listening to this. And this is a session which is looking at kind of individualism in its Western version, as, as individualism has been honed and presented in Western media, Western culture over the past half century ago. And so I'm more than a little conscious that doesn't apply to everybody listening to this. Nevertheless, with the reach of the internet, globalism, I th think we're all aware that uh, what I'm gonna be talking about has a reach uh, certainly beyond uh, what we think of as Western culture. So I hope you'll find it interesting. And I'd invite you to listen to what I'm saying uh, along the lines of, well, what rings true in your culture and what rings less true for the moment. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's get started. And I, I think most people, certainly again across the West, seem to have viewed at least one of the movies in the uh, Bourne franchise, the Jason Bourne franchise starring uh, Matt Damon. And uh, in his first movie, The Bourne Identity, you'll remember uh, we entered the story to find Jason Bourne wounded, clinging on for his life, being fished out of the water by a fisherman. And he has total amnesia uh, with nothing more to go on than a Swiss bank account number. And the, the question the film sets up for us is that of identity. Who is Jason Bourne? And uh, various clues appear. Um, he discovers there are people who want to see him dead. Who are they? Why? And he discovers too that he possesses the combat skills of a world-class spy. But what are they for? Who is Jason Bourne? Now, if you think of it, Bourne's dilemma isn't far removed from, from the dilemma of every one of us listening to, to this video. In, in, in fact, every human being. We emerge blinking into the world, a world not of our own making. But who are we? We have skills and, and strengths that we develop, but what are they for? Most of us don't have to flee from people who want to see us dead, well, at least most of us, but death itself is coming after us, every one of us. And in the light of those existential realities, who are we? What are we for? It's, it's a question that causes us to reach to the stars with this big uh, issue of identity. And the question I, I want to pose and put at the heart of this session today is on what or whom should we base this of identity? Is there any foundation available to us on which we build this sense of self? Well, to put it another way, um, is there any template, any pattern of the self available to us or in the process of the formation of a concept of ourselves, are we on our own? And that's the question that sits at the heart of this session, okay? But before we go any further, a couple of points, and I think they're important to make. The first, and say, what is this thing? Who is this 
person. And quite clear, identity is the answer we give to that question. It is more precisely the concept we hold of ourselves, the story we tell about ourselves. Uh, and the process of developing a, um, this concept of ourselves, it, it begins sometime usually by the age of two. And that's the point when, uh, if, if you put a black sticker secretly on, onto the cheek of a child and invite them to look in the mirror, for the first time, they look in the mirror and they point to the person in the mirror, but then point back to themselves, to the sticker. In this sense of awareness, this growing sense of awareness that they are a being to be differentiated from the world. And the question then is who is, what is this? being and it, it, it's an answer that evolves over the course of our lives and of course um, over the next few years when our little toddler grows up lots of bits of himself go into building self concept don't they there's his age and sex and social status education eventual employment um, sexuality relationship commitments and, and all of that. Um, and of course, Eric Erickson, the psychiatrist most famous for coining the term identity crisis, identified adolescence as the key period, the critical period of intensive analysis of different ways of looking at and construing ourselves. Now, he didn't say that identity is completely fixed at that time, but he did suggest that identity so that adolescence is the time at which the broad shape of the self is established. The central rising themes of the personality are in place. Okay? And so identity is the concept we hold of ourselves. But then the other point I wanted to raise, is the process of identity formation important? Well, of course it is matters because without this sense in a core we'd be rudderless um, like ships tossed in a storm behaving this way one day and that way another believing this thing one day and and another tomorrow with nothing to provide ballast and stability the self is constantly contingent and at risk there's no sense of direction no ability to set goals and commitments and to sustain our motivation around them. So you can't be a vegan one day and a bullfighter the next. Well, I mean, you could, but you would be confused and so would those around you. Okay, so clearly identity and, and this development of this self-concept is important for the stability of personality development. Okay, so we've tried to understand what identity is and why it's important. Now back to that key question at the beginning. In the process of developing this concept, on what or on whom should I base the foundation of the self? Or to put it another way, is there a pattern that I can follow that, that helps me um, a blueprint that helps me organize the different bits of myself into some coherent story. And if there is, what ought that to be? Well, you see, everybody, psychological models provide insights into how the big questions of meaning and existential purpose shape and color our sense of self. Who am I? What is my purpose? Psychology and uh, scientific psychology especially points us to the importance of those questions, yes, but how does it instruct us in how those questions should be answered? In your question, can it instruct us in how they should be answered? That is the point, I think, where much modern psychology and modern counselling 
in concert with the wider individualism in our culture goes astray. And I think it goes astray like this. The answer that is usually given, explicit in some counseling models, psychological models, and implicit in all of them today, is that the answer is to be found by looking inside the self. The answer to life, big questions, meaning, purpose, destiny, are found by looking within and living authentically with what you find there. Value and meaning, important, yes, but you need to find your values, your truth, your meaning, and live authentically with that. Now, of course, this is off right, is it? I mean, it's a good start because the answer to life's big questions do start from within in the sense that you must take responsibility for, for answering those questions. You, you, you can't outsource responsibility for decision-making about the big questions of life to some external authority figure or a mentor or guide. Well, of course you can, and some do, but that is not the path of maturity as a human being. So it, it's a start. We do need to start from within by taking responsibility for questions we ask, yes. But today, so much counseling depends on the idea that we remain within ourselves in the search for the as well. Answers that may come from external authorities, from any sense of there being a pattern or a, a blueprint for our humanity. Any idea that there are values out there to which we may owe allegiance and which may lay claim to shaping our sense of self and life is viewed with a deep sense of suspicion and we're directed back inside the self or the sources of the self. The, um, a, um, an ethicist, um, academic ethicist uh, in the UK called James Monford and he's written a uh, a paper recently, I think it was in the New Atlantis, or is it the New Atlantic? I meant to check that, but James Monford illustrates rather well in a very good article he wrote in that particular paper just a few days ago. And I, I want to read you what he said, because um, he's giving an account of his own experience of being hospitalized with a bipolar disorder. And, and it's, it's very moving and authentic. And I want you to listen to what he says. He said this, today, meaning today in his hospital ward as a patient, he says, we are presented with a handout listing various values. We've been asked to circle the ones that resonate with us. Next, the psychologist with a flourish ventures an observation. Each of us, he says, has different values. What's more? We often disagree about our values. So he concludes, values are subjective and our recovery, our restoration to sanity hinges upon our willingness to choose our own values. He lets us know that while morality, quote, is externally imposed by society, unquote, it's imperative that we be the ones to pick which ideals, morals, judgments, and rules to live by. Now, writes Mumford, harmless, surely. Who would deny that it's vital that my values be ones I properly signed up for, rather than had foisted on me by parents or teachers or culture? But this truism that I will be more likely to live out a set of values if I've consciously adopted them doesn't exhaust the sense of what the psychologist is saying here. My psychologist is, in, is implying something more radical when he insists on the pivotal importance of choosing our own values. When he claims that values are subjective, he is painting a picture of the world according to which the only values that exist 
are ones we have created. To say values are subjective is to say there's nothing independent of our own minds that answers to our talk of right and wrong. It is to say that our ethical beliefs do not track a reality which is there anyway, independent of us. No, according to his picture, selfhood, what it means to be a person, is therefore fundamentally about choice, not vision. It is about picking a course of action arbitrarily, not about seeking a reality that transcends you and seeking to integrate with it. It's a really interesting piece. I'd recommend you read the whole thing. But do you see the point being illustrated here, everybody? He said, he's saying, he's, he's saying, of course, we need to start from within by taking responsibility for the questions we ask, yes. But he's pointing out that today, so much counseling depends on the idea that we remain within ourselves for the answers as well. The sources of the self are found only from within the self. This is a deeply Gnostic idea. And it's what um, Charles Taylor, the Canadian philosopher, calls the buffered self, which is part of modern individualism, in which the self now transcends the reality in which it sits and buffers itself against that reality in order to create its own reality. Now, where does this modern individualism, this radical individualism, as we're calling it, uh, come from. I'd love to have a couple of hours to talk uh, about some of the, the history of ideas that lead up to this. But let, let me just pull out one philosopher, if I can. And, and I think uh, he was critical to the development of today's individualism, the 19th century German atheistic philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, who famously declared, do you remember, God is dead, he said, he remains dead, and we killed him. Now, what makes Nietzsche so interesting, it isn't that, that he was an atheist, in, in fact, lots of people, particularly amongst the intellectual elite, were atheists. Uh, at the time, it was almost fashionable in certain circles. No, no not his atheism, what was new and important about what Nietzsche had to say was that he grasped the consequences of atheism and pressed them home. You can't have it both ways, he argued. In, in Western thought, God has served as the foundation for objective truth. But if God is dead, and if we killed him, then we take the responsibilities, he's arguing, for that, there's no foundation and there's no objective truth. You can't continue to rely on there being some objective world. You can't appeal some external tribunal to adjudicate between your thoughts in terms of ethics and value and morality and beauty and truth itself. And. Uh, you know, Nietzsche, uh, he advocated for something called perspectivalism. You know, there's, there's my truth, it's your truth. It's nothing like the truth. In the world of ideas, there's just ideas and there's power, he said. And the ideas that make it to the top of the heap are simply those ideas that belong to the people with the power. So what's Nietzsche's remedy? Well, he advocated that we face this bleak world with the power of the will, the ubermensch, the superman, the superperson. I assert my own will. I don't slavishly concede to other people's power and therefore other people's ideas. In the absence of ultimate truth, I define the truth. Listen, let me, let me quote. I assert my will to power, he said. In a world of clashing values, be your own hero. It's the primacy of will over reason. Quoting Nietzsche again, listen. 
No one can argue sorry, no one can construct for you the bridge upon which precisely you must cross the stream of life. No one but yourself alone. He went on, become the person you are. Sound familiar? Become the person you are. I tell you everybody, Nietzsche's on our streets today. He's on our screens. He's everywhere. He's in the air. We breathe across Western culture. Don't you tell me who I am. Don't you tell me what I must do. I get to decide. And uh, if reality doesn't line up with my choices, then it's reality that needs to change. Not, not me. If, even in the sphere of my bodily life, if my bodily life doesn't line up with what I, or my bodily reality doesn't line up with what I feel about myself, then we will change my body. You, if you don't line up with what I feel about myself, then I will change you. I will cancel you and remove you. Just be yourself. And I think the problem for those of us contesting this value is that it sounds good and it's marketable, isn't it? Hey, you be you. What not to like? It sounds good. It sounds easy. It sounds plausible. And if Madonna gets it, what is she saying, I am my own experiment. I am my own work of art. And even Elsa in the movie Frozen, she gets it. No right, no wrong, she sings, no rules for me. Then they get, we all get it. And that's the individualism that's in there that we breathe. But I guess now let's, we're ready to move on to the $64,000 question. Well, if it's everywhere around us, it's in air we breathe and if it's marketed to us as the solution does the solution work after nearly rather over half a century over which this philosophy has dominated western culture how are we doing well i think for an insight into this and some actual data we can go to uh, the self-esteem movement. And I want you to look at this uh, for a moment with me. Morris Rosenberg is the name for those psychiatrists out there, probably most identified with what's come to be called the self-esteem movement. It's nearly 60 years old now. Um, it really got going in the late 50s. But by the year 2000, it got going in the 50s, by the year 2000, the concept of self-esteem had become one of the top three most researched subjects in the whole of academic psychology. In fact, according to the LexisNexis database, 60 years ago, there were just two or 300 articles per year on self-esteem. By the early 2000s, you could count 35,000 articles a year in the US alone, okay? That's the scale and the reach of, of this movement, which of course filtered through in popular culture. You're special, love yourself, be worthy, just say how much you're worth and so on. So, what is the message of the self-esteem movement? It's really that. And, and I guess at one level, it's a stroke of genius because self-esteem, the value we, we, we worth, we attribute to ourselves, it is a problem where we base our self-esteem on the esteem of others, isn't it? On the recognition, the approval of others as social beings, we instinctively look to, look to others to decide our worth. In, in, in our title, title I took from Francis Fukuyama, his book on identity politics, the struggle for recognition. We struggle for recognition because we desire the value of others 
that they can place on us to give us dignity and worth, significance. But as the self-esteem movement really observed, we're running on a treadmill when we base our sense of worth on other people, aren't we? Because people are fickle. You can win their approval one day and lose it the next. Try to impress them with what we achieve one day, but, but, but then we stop achieving and we kill or we get old, we retire. And now who are we? What are we worth? What is our significance? I remember talking to somebody quite a while ago and she said to me, you know, um, you know that, that sport, the high jump? She said, I don't know why people do that. You've trained so hard. And she said, what do you do? Once you, you get over the, over the bar successfully and everyone gives you a clap, what do they do? She said, they always move higher and you have to try again. And then with some emotion in her voice, she said, my father was like that. And no matter how hard I tried, in a way, no matter how high I jumped in attempts to meet his expectations of me, he always moved the bar higher. That's the problem. When we base our sense of worth on other people's recognition, we are ultimately, our sense of worth is ultimately complete contingent and fickle and unstable. It's the boom or bust ego, self-esteem that constantly hangs on a thread, vulnerable. So, says the self-esteem movement, and this is its stroke of genius, where, where, where do you, on, you base your sense of worth? Well, you say what you're worth, self-esteem. The self esteems itself. It stops looking to other people for its sense of worth. It awards its own. See the attraction of this. There's only one way the treadmill of trying to earn other people's approval is to give it to yourself. It's pure Nietzsche in many ways. You assert your worth and you brandish it in the face of the world. And again, this ideology as part of Western individualism is, is everywhere around us. Every school prize giving speech, every Oscar acceptance speech, every stage movie, the latest Netflix, every stage musical, the latest Netflix movie, I am my own experiment. I am my own work of art. And self-esteem is helpful as some kind of indicator of whether modern individualism, and particularly self-definition works and whether it's enhancing well-being and improving mental health, because we do have some data on the effectiveness of efforts to raise self-esteem. And I, I can summarize that data fairly briefly. There's no evidence that boosting self-esteem by encouraging people to enhance their own worth actually works. And uh, if you want to see more of that evidence, I summarize it in, in my book, Ego Trip, uh, published by IVP. Uh, but, but maybe I, I could just summarize one particular study that's always captured my imagination. It was carried out by Joanne Wood at the uh, University of Ontario in Hamilton, Canada. Uh, and uh, Joanne Wood uh, took a group of students, she divided them into three groups, she randomly allocated certain conditions between the three groups. And what she did was she took a group of cards with self-boosting statements on them. I am special, I'm worthy. I enter a room and attract people. I have a magnetic sense of worth and attractiveness. Those kind of self-boosting statements. And she gives 
a bunch of these cards to the first group. And she says, here's your task. For the next three months, I want you to have a, a, a period of meditation every day, about 20 to 30 minutes, in which I want you to go through these cards and seek to make them true of yourself. Seek to absorb their truth about yourself and assert these truths of yourself, okay? That's their task. Second group got the same bunch of cards, but they're given a different task. She says, I want you to spend 20, 30 minutes every day. And I want you to meditate on these cards. And I want you to ask this question as you meditate, how much of this is true? And how much of this is not true of me? The third group get nothing at all, okay? They do at the end of three months and then six months. Well, John Wood had carried out a raft of psychological measures at baseline and then at the end. And what she found out was, well, actually groups two and three, uh, really not much happened at all, but in group one, interesting. The people who, at the beginning of the study, low self-worth, that is, they rated their worth as individual as being low, at the end of the period of attempting to boost sense of worth felt worse on average. And Joanne Wood concludes, these techniques of self-affirmation, she said, they seem to make people who already feel good about themselves feel a little better, but they backfire for the people who need them most. Why? Because they're just your own propaganda. And indeed, if you survey the self-esteem literature, the evidence is that these kind of attempts to affirm oneself not only don't work, but they may cause harm. Um, a psychologist, Jennifer Crocker, showed how it erodes our capacity to feel empathy because we're so focused on making our own esteem that we lose empathy for others. Research as Carol Dweck shows how it demotivates us from taking risks because we want to preserve our precious sense of esteem. And in order to maintain your sense of yourself as a winner in life, you mustn't put at risk and potentially be a loser. And so she finds children become risk averse when they're entered into a climate of self-affirmation and self-boosting. So what I, what I want to do is, is from the self-esteem data that's out there suggests to you that the whole project of self-definition is fraught with problems. It likely doesn't work and it may be contributing to the decline in mental health across Western culture in the past few years. Now, let me just say, I, I'm an epidemiologist, so I know these are simply inferences that I'm making, but I do think they're plausible inferences. We don't have experimental data that draws a straight line from, say, the failure of the self-esteem movement and with it contemporary individualism to the recent rise in mental health problems across the West. No, of course we don't have those data. But I, I, the causal relationships are far too complex and multi-layered. But I, I think we can say this. After 60 years of selfism in culture, and in therapies, we're certainly not getting more mentally healthy. And it's at least a plausible case that more individualism and selfism is contributing to a, a deterioration in mental health and well being in recent years. So, finally, last couple of minutes do we as Christians have another story? I think we do. I, I, I want to suggest that the Christian doctrine that beings are made in the image of God is a gift to the world. Even outside of explicit Christian faith, of course, the idea that every human being has dignity, 
and worth as made in the image of God has made a huge impact on modern philosophy of human rights. Here is a basis on which a non-contingent sense of dignity and worth can properly rest. And of course, for the believer, the deeper existential experience that we are loved by God himself strengthens and buttresses our sense of self and provides a sense of ballast in which our experience of ourselves can develop. But rightly understood, this doctrine conveys another profound truth as well, doesn't it? That meaning and purpose in life is not found by looking inside ourselves alone. Of course, we take responsibility for the decisions we must make, but to limit the sources of our self concept to what we find inside, ho oh, hum, who's, who's, what do we find there that lifts the spirit beyond itself to something greater, so thin, so conventional? The gift we have for the world is that true meaning a real sense of stability of the self and of direction and purpose is found in orienting oneself for higher good to an objective world of value and beauty and truth. True life and purpose and a sense of self is found in participating in a story that is bigger than just me the calling to the God and to serve the God in whose image I'm made. I think that's an, an, another important part of being made in the image of God. It not only conveys the basis for human worth, rightly understood, it is a calling, a mission to live as the image of God we live to his glory. You know, Jennifer Crocker, the, the psychologist I mentioned earlier, the self-esteem researcher I mentioned, she talks about the importance of finding our identity as part of a story bigger than ourselves. Self-esteem doesn't work in and of itself, she says. It's a psychological cul-de-sac. It turns the self back in on itself. And we've seen together in this talk the problems that that can cause. No, she said, we need to discover a sense of ourselves within a story bigger than ourselves. But of course, as a secularist, she, she, she has no real idea of what that story might be. And she says, you have to find your own bigger story. And she, she suggests being an eco worm might be a possible option. Well, as Christian medics, of course, we can't prescribe our worldview to patients. We must not do that and use our power relationship to influence the beliefs of our patients in that authoritarian way. But I think we can recover our confidence seeking the limitations of contemporary individualism and critiquing limitations of the subjectivism that James Mumford talked about earlier and claiming the right alongside other worldviews to place our own humans made in the image and beauty of God himself called to live meaningful lives because because they are oriented to a higher good, which ultimately is found in the God of the universe himself. Okay, we're through, folks. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and I'll hand back to you to pick up on questions, Peter. Thanks very much, Glenn. Really stimulating uh, journey through a, a very difficult concept to understand. So thanks for making it so clear. And uh, we have got a time of question and answer now. Uh, Glenn, the first question, uh, Christians can often take on elements of the culture in which they're, they're placed. You know, we're, we're told, aren't we, by the Apostle Paul, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. 
to what extent do you think Western Christians have taken on this view of Western individualism? And, and how has that affected our life and witness as a church? Yeah, um, I, I think that's a really great question. Thank you for whoever um, asked that, because uh, I, I do think uh, this has certainly happened. Uh, and, and we see it, you know, uh, when I was a little boy in a long, long time ago, e even before Peter, which, which is saying something, um, I, I can remember being taught a, um, a, a chorus as a youngster, which was Jesus first, myself last, and others in between. Now, we don't hear that kind of, we don't encourage our kids to sing that kind of song. Um, and along came another, and it's a great song, actually. I'm not criticizing it, but along comes, if I were a butterfly, you see, and that, that in, the, in the 70s and 80s, 90s, was piggybacking onto this more modern kind of selfism, which likes to see the self at the, at the center of the picture. Now, of course, it, it's not all, and this isn't an either or thing. It, it's important that many people do recover a sense of themselves. There are far too many people, among them Christians, who be oppressed um, by, by people that should not be doing so and who need to free themselves from that and found themselves under God as individual loved human beings. I mean, that's been an important part of many people's journey and we need to realize that. I'm critiquing here is the imbalance that we swing over far too far. And I think we do see that in church culture, a kind of pick and mix mentality. If I'm honest, I see it in myself too, that I, that I like to have a look at, you, you know, what's happening next week. Does it suit me? Those are my instincts now. Honed by who's preaching? Will that be entertaining? Will I like that? Uh, what's on what and 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 I think we do need to examine our own hearts as to the extent we're being drawn into a way of looking at the world which which basically premises what's in this for me and uh, and combat that how how would you help uh, and it's not not at all an uncommon problem but how how would you help Christians who are struggling with self-esteem? themselves it is yeah i think what what we have to uh, do here is clearly get the story first of all there are going to be a, lots of different stories behind this and some will be really hard stories uh early childhood issues attachment issues children who've been beaten down you know i can remember one woman saying to me, it, it, it was my mother's mission in life. It was her mission in life to negate me and to, uh, and, and to destroy my confidence. And I, she was not the kind of person, believe me, who was prone to exaggerate. Uh, she had been really, so, so there are all kinds of journeys that I think can go into developing a sense of self i think one then has to encourage the person and this comes partly as one mediates god's love to that person in that you are there for them as a therapist you you this you know you, they have your time they have your acceptance they have your attention and that models a little of, of a deeper truth a christian pastor a christian counselor with permission to bring in a christian worldview I think then you have the possibility of bringing to that person the deep truth that they are loved unconditionally by God. Now, just telling somebody that isn't going to undo years of nurturing the idea that I am uh, have no value whatsoever. And I, I think one has to then help the person develop cognitive exercises to having flushed out these feelings and owned them and accepted that they're part of one's journey, then one has to begin to reject and rebut those false ideas about the self that have been implanted and seek to nurture a different view of oneself based in the unconditional God. The 
I do think we need to do, if I can just take a couple more minutes on this, is help people distinguish between approval of their basic self as a, as a, a loved human being and as a child of God, and the approval that comes from specific gifts, strengths, or even a disapproval that comes from weaknesses. We're all beautiful creatures made in the image of God under restoration in Christ again. That is the base of our sense of worth. But of course, we come with very gifts and capabilities, and some of those some are not so strong. And of course, we need to recognize that we will be a pr- that our strengths will meet with approval and our weaknesses will meet with disapproval. We need to get over that and accept that as part of our journey of being human. And I, I, I do think one of the problems we have as Christians, we find it hard to accept that kind of approval. Uh, you know, if somebody says, you know, that really helped me. Thank you so much. We say, oh, it wasn't me. You know, it was the Lord. I always want to say it was the Lord. No, it wasn't that good. You know, it was you, not, not, not the Lord. <laughs> but you know, people say it wasn't me, it was the Lord, because somehow we don't want to accept that, that approval because it would boost us up. I, I would suggest try to draw a distinction between your importance as a person and your competences as a person. Your importance rests on God's acceptance and love for you. Your competences, there are going to be strengths and weaknesses on them. Where you have strengths, accept people's approval, their compliments, their encouragement. Thank you very much. You know, uh, I'm, and, and in your heart, you can say, I think I'm good at that. that. Encouragement is going to help me work at it. But it doesn't make me any more important than the tramp I step over on the way up from this particular meeting or the, the arena where I receive that appro- approval. Do you see? Try to put a wedge between your competences and your basic worth. I think that's an important trick that I that I I think we need to keep practicing on right through our life. Just because I'm a brilliant footballer or a good speaker or a good organizer, which I am, by the way, you know, I own those competences, doesn't make me a more important person than somebody else. I, I didn't know that you were a brilliant footballer, so I've learned that today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, you've talked about this tremendously liberating concept, foundational concept of being made in the image of God. How do you apply the importance of being made in the image of God in psychiatric practice to patients who don't hold this view? Uh, yeah. how, how, does it, how does it affect the way you relate to them and, and the way also that you try to help them with issues of self-esteem? Yeah, yeah, I, and that, this is a really good question. It's the kind of question that comes up all of the time, of course. And in regular psychiatric practice where one's employed by the state or in which one isn't functioning with an explicit Christian worldview or you're not part of an explicitly Christian practice or of Christian-based therapy, if there's nothing explicit about that, and you're really working within a secular framework, then you, you don't have the right to make explicit your worldview, because I, I do think you need to be aware of the power imbalance between doctor and patient, and that you that isn't used in any way to influence or over-influence people with your views. But I, I do think that one's that every human being is made in the image of God has to be implicit in all that one does, because that is the philosophical basis on which I see this person as a person of worth and dignity and worth my time and worth my investment and part of my calling to all of humanity. So um, I, I think it's profoundly implicit in all that one does. Um, I do think as well, and I, I, I'd want to put this carefully, but it seems to me, take that example from James Mumford, where 
that psychologist had no difficulty offering to vulnerable patients a worldview which is just that. It's a worldview which can be traced back to Nietzsche through Sartre and post-structuralism right into that ward. Well, that is a philosophical point of view. And I, I, I think therefore it becomes equally valid to say, well, that's an interesting way of looking at things. And obviously people have to make up their own minds here, but I actually think there's another way of looking at things that there is an objective world of value. And that as we reach out to that world, there's an objective beauty and truth and goodness, which can basis who I start over again. Now, I, I think provided one describes one's worldview alongside other worldviews and isn't seen to be prescribing or using one position in uh, an, an unfair way, then I think it's perfectly reasonable to do that. And I, I, I do think we need to recover our confidence because the evidence base for individualism and subjectivism is so thin. We really need to recover our confidence in saying, no, but there are other worldviews in play as well, which I think have equal validity here. And I'd certainly feel confident uh, in wanting to do that. And this is fascinating and I'm, I'm afraid we've virtually run out of time now and there's a lot more questions but I just wanted to ask you one one more question in closing uh, just picking up on this point you used of the illustration with the child with the black dot uh, looking in a mirror at the age of two and realizing that he or she had an identity at that time or, or was a self uh, the Lord Jesus, of course, came into this world as a baby, and so given that he was made in, in uh, made fully man and fully God, he must have had a moment of self-identity as well. Uh, can we learn anything from where Jesus might have looked to gain his sense of self-identity? <laughs> wow. Uh, I, I, that is, uh, that Jesus in a life, um, even as an adult is, is, is so, you know, is the possibility of so much conjecture, right? I, I'm, I'm reluctant to, to, to try to speculate, uh, as, as a child, other than to observe that both his parents and then he in his own developing self awareness um, made him very much part of a context which was shaping his story of who he was. And uh, I think if, if you remember that wonderful phrase when he was 12, did you not know I must be about my father's business? And I, I think it, it was that actually that, that shaped his sense of self. This is who I am, one who must be my father's business. And I, I think one of the most wonderful messages, if we can regain our confidence in the face of modern individualism, is this. It's this. You go right into the world and say, your life is not about you. If you wish as a human being, God, and it says, your life is not about you. And you see in the life of Christ, uh, a man who pours himself out for a higher purpose, a purpose that wasn't about him, that was about his father's business to save the world. And I, I do think that, that this is a wonderful gift we as Christians have to be part of this story that's bigger than us, but which intimately involves us in its execution its final consuming. So, yeah. A uh, be beautiful note to end on uh, about his father's business. Then thank you so much. We've been listening to Lynn Harrison, Professor Harrison, talking about identity in the study. Thank you, everyone. For recognition, is Western individualism a cause or cure? So it just remains for me to say thank you again, Glenn, for your time and wisdom today, and to all of you for coming along today. and contributing with your questions and being with us. We hope to see you again soon on ICMDA.
webinars. God bless you.